welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed break and the networking, so now it's time to continue with our program. If there is one thing for sure which we are sustainable at is being on time in the Western Balkans, so thank you for that. Please, next time, surely be on time and punctual. Our next session is titled ESG Regulation, Getting Ready for Compliance. This session will explore the challenges and best practices associated with compliance with the ESG regulations that are being introduced around the world to prevent greenwashing and increase transparency around sustainability claims made by companies and investors. Our panelists for this session are domain experts from institutions and professional service firms. They will share their opinions on the implications of the sustainable finance regulation package that will impose mandatory sustainability reporting on large companies and financial institutions. The European Union is leading the way in this area and we are privileged to have some of the best minds in the industry with us today to discuss this important topic. And without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists for this session. Maria Jovanovic, moderator and lecturer at the Essex Law School. Robert Spano, partner at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher and former president of the European Court of Human Rights. Branko Gabric from Getzic Law. Olindo Shehu, managing partner at Deloitte CE South. Luzim Rafuna, president of the VB6 CIF Management Board. And Alexandra Nyagul, co-founder of Sustinery Partners. The floor is yours. I would like to open this panel by congratulating the organizers on their vision, leadership and unparalleled dedication in making this event happen. Um, in one of his latest books, Henry Kissinger tells us that any society, whatever its political system, is perpetually in transit between a past that forms its memory and a vision of the future that inspires its evolution. Along this route, leadership is indispensable. Without leadership, nations court growing irrelevance and ultimately disaster. This event gathers leaders from both public and private sectors who have recognized the need and indeed necessity to chart out the future of the Western Balkans and its economic development grounded in three frequently repeated and often misunderstood letters. We are fortunate to have on this panel a group of distinguished experts who will share it with us their thoughts, thoughts on the fast evolving ESG regulatory landscape and hopefully advise on how regional actors can best prepare for compliance. Moments ago, Mr. Robert Spano has delivered a majestic keynote address on the evolution of the global ESG agenda and the driving forces behind this process. And our panel here looks at the implications of these global regulatory trends on the businesses and governments in the region. I will like to invite Mr. Spanner to open this panel, but before that, I just need to add that in the spirit of the venue, I will act as a general and be very fierce with timekeeping. So, Mr. Spanner, could you maybe start by telling us uh, how will these growing ESG regulation, in your view, impact companies outside the EU, and, and what are particular particular risks of ignoring these trends? My answer would be twofold. The first is, as I said just now, in the EU, the European Union, through its action plan in this field, is imposing quite wide-ranging obligations on EU-established entities. Now, these obligations will impact their business models in at least two ways. The first is they will have to assess for the purpose of public reporting their sustainability matters, their sustainability criteria based on metrics which are now being drafted and introduced in the EU. Secondly, these entities will have to perform due diligence in their supply chains, what the EU calls chain of activities. 
Now, those supply chains are both upstream and downstream, which means that all non-EU business partners, including in this region, will be affected. For them to be able to maintain their relationships with EU entities, and it, we, for example, can mention the last year's enactment of the German Due Diligence Supply Chain Act, this will require regional businesses to be mindful that these EU entities will have supplier codes of conduct, which will require business partners to demonstrate that they're able to meet in the relationship with the EU entities the requirements of EU law. So to sum up, as it is often framed, in this environment, the Brussels effect which is the extraterritorial effect of EU regulation, will be wide-ranging. Thank you. Um, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the different roles played by all actors in this process, including the governments, the businesses, but also us consumers and, and clients. Is there, how is this, synergy going to be created or is created? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I can answer it from the perspective of the EU, where this process has been, I would say, quite uh, synergetic in the sense that because of the evolution of EU law as sort of a holistic internal market regulation, you have trade entities of the various businesses that are heavily involved in the actual policy making process because businesses in the EU realize that this is what will come. They have then, and I say they with a, with a caveat of course, it's not a fully open-ended process, but governments have enlisted the policy making uh, capacities of businesses. Of course then also with uh, stakeholders, the stakeholder concept being very broad, stakeholder engagement being a very broad concept. So within the EU, I would say it is indeed a very synergetic process. I think for the region, and I'm very happy to see members of governments here today, which I understand are very keen on implementing these reforms, I think it is important that the same kind of ideology is pervasive in this region that it is a joined up process, not a process of hostility, to understand that this process is one where everybody needs to work together. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, I will save questions about how this impacts businesses in the countries for our other panelists who are um, more familiar with the region. But may I just ask you um, to give us a look at the future and where you think we are now when it comes, because I, I, I like your keynote presentation where you talked about how it all started. And I just wonder how you see the short, medium and long-term evolution of, of these standards. I think we are, and I'm gonna use an English term which I hope is translated correctly for those in the room that are not uh, completely conversant in English. We are at an inflection point when it comes to the way in which businesses engage with their societies. In my view, there is no turning back. As I say to my clients in this field, you either get with the program and you understand that your profit margins for the future will be detrimental, will be marginalized if you don't incorporate these principles, or you do and you demonstrate the benefits. There's one element I want to mention here, and that's for the investment community. As those engaging in investments will know, investment analysis is something that is done by specialists who are now more and more, by virtue of nature, becoming younger people. Younger people that in their investment analysis are incorporating almost by default the ideas of the ESG world also due to the nature of the metrics which are now becoming traditional. So the future, I think, will be a future where conferences like this are not uh, abnormal, they are traditional. This is a part of the nature of the way business is evolving because 
ultimately an inverse conclusion, another approach is simply not sustainable, to use the word which is over-encompassing here today. Thank you very much, and I'm sure we can come back to some of these points, but I would like to move us on to our next speaker, Mr. Branko Gabric, on behalf of Getic Law. He will tell us about how these global trends that Mr. Spano has just uh, outlined reflect on the region and which instruments already impact business actors in a region. So would you like to start by just telling us what is the most pressing issue uh, for the businesses today in, in the Western Balkans? So basically what uh, we need to understand is that uh, EU is our trading partner number one and about 70% of our international trades in the whole Western Balkan region is, uh, is uh, trades to, to the EU. And the other, other, other thing that I would like to point is that uh, EU is a front runner in this sustain, sustainability transition, meaning that uh, one of the goals of EU will be to level playing field between the industries. Industries that are producing inside the borders of the European Union and industries that are exporting the goods into the EU. And that is something that uh, brings us to the conclusions that our industry will be heavily impacted. And as a Example, so, so to say, in terms of the decarbonization uh, policy of EU, EU has established some, something like 18 years ago, an instrument which is called ETS, and uh, basically it is a carbon tax mechanism which enabled most energy consuming industries in EU to lower their carbon footprint for 40%. And that is significant. Now, we have a CBAM on the door, and the CBAM aims to do the same, but to, towards the EU exporting partners. So whenever our industries for Western Balkans will uh, import their goods into the EU, they will have to pay a carbon tax. And that is something that they will have to be prepared even though maybe the government has not set all the procedures and all the local regulation in place, they will have to obey the EU state of play. Thank you very much. And I, can, I, can I ask you to elaborate a little bit more? When you say businesses will, when, when is that time in the future? And how do they, what do they need to do today to be ready for that? So, in terms of the CBAM, it will, it will be implemented gradually. It will come in, forest in the 1st of October this year, yes. with the reporting obligation coming in forest in January next year. So, there is no really much time to comply, even though in this first transitional phase, uh, obligation will be only entitled to the monitoring of the CO2 emissions and to reporting it properly to the European Commission under the, this first transitional period, which will end up in 2025, there will be no payables in regards to the, to the carbon, carbon taxes, but the industries will have to implement the standards so that they are compliant with the ways of how it is done in the EU in terms of measurement and monitoring. And, and, and I'm very curious, how does that happen? How do businesses learn about those I, new requirements, what do they do, and I, especially how does this affect smaller uh, uh, businesses that do not have capacity to? CBAM mm -hmm. will, will uh, come into the force gradually, so at the first stage it will cover only the most energy intensive productions such as steels, aluminium, cement, fertilizers, electricity, etc. Et so, in this first phase, they will be directly impacted, leaving some space to other rather smaller entities and industries to, 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 to try to prepare themselves for what is inevitably going to happen. Thank you. And if I understand you correctly, do, do you think that given the exposure to, these, to the e European market, what, is there an alternative to compliance? <laughs> um, well, if we can 
stop trading with the EU, we might have alternative, but that is not how the world is going. So I think that that is just a matter of time and not the option. Thank you. Yes, that's what I wanted to hear, the, the <laughs> sense of urgency. Yes, Sasha. Yes, we're talking about EU because it's on the door, right? But let's not forget that Asian taxonomy is coming. Um, and it's practically you know, adopted in some countries in Asia. Um, US SEC has proposed also uh, climate reporting. It will you know, face some opposition from, from conservatives and so on, but it will come. So uh, this idea that we will be able to trade with anybody um, you know, even, you know, okay, we're going to ignore EU, we don't want to deal with CBAM, we're going to trade somewhere else. It doesn't exist. So we need to get on with the program. I think it's a powerful and important message from this panel that, uh, to use your words, Mrs. Pano, no more flowery language, it's time to roll up the sleeves. Um, I would, thank you so much. I would now like to uh, invite our next panelist, Ms. Mr. Olindo Shehu, who will share with us how Deloitte leads and supports its clients in navigating these uh, evolving landscape. Thank you, uh, pleasure to be here. Before I actually get to the question, I want to maybe add a few more thoughts to the questions that you asked Robert. I think it's very important that even to quantify the risks that we would all face if we don't do anything today. In 2022, uh, Deloitte did a global analysis and to put some figures behind the risks globally, if we do nothing, it will cost to the world economy 168 trillion by 2070, if we don't do nothing. In our opinion, there is no if, time is now. And if we act now, that will cause the world economy an increase, a gain, of 42 trillion. And these are quantified risks that represent the present value, of course, with lots of assumptions. But this directionally gives an idea of what the potential risk is if we don't do anything. So we can talk about compliance and regulatory, and it's a must. But it starts with us. It starts with us first, individually. I have three daughters, I wanna leave them a better place than I found. And if I don't believe that as a leader, then I will not be able to lead any topic in my own company or to the clients that I serve. And that's what we did at Deloitte. We started with us. We started to embed sustainability as part of our culture. And then we decided to invest 1 billion euro in building capacities to help clients. That's how strongly we believe that sustainability is not a choice, it's the future. Just in our region that regulatory is not even existent yet as much as it should be, we have 100 people that we are actually dealing with sustainability and serving our clients. So you asked about the future, I think sustainability is the future. Um, I can go back to your question. Of course, yeah. Please. Um, uh, can I? Uh, okay, sure. let me prompt you. But a let's bit. have it as a discussion. Yeah. So I'm curious in terms of uh, about what what is the current demand of the businesses that you work with? Uh, what are their your clients' demands when they come to you? What what do they need when it comes to ESG? It's very diverse. We have because in our region, at least personally, I lead the region that is composed of EU countries and non-EU countries. In the EU countries, the asks, the demand are, uh, are clear because it's also driven by the regulatory. But to nobody's surprise here, I'm sure, many of us, including myself, for a long time did not even know what sustainability truly meant. And so many CEOs or CFOs would come to our meetings and say, okay, I hear about this sustainability, I hear that I need to talk to the board, but what the hell do I talk about? Because this was actually, initially, was quite an uh, ambiguous uh, topic. We did a survey with the Institute of Financial um, Transformation, and we, uh, the central finding was that every company needs to have a sustainability chief officer. It starts with the 
with, with, with an individual that needs to lead the topic, and then, of course, making it as part of the agenda. So initially, our clients are actually asking how to cope with all this info that is actually being thrown at us, at, at them. And then second, to understand what do they need to do in order to actually be competitive in the future? Because, yes, in our region, regulatory is very vague. And us as companies are leading by example. That's our choice. But from the business perspective, if we don't do it, we lose competitiveness. And I will not repeat what has already been said, but the supply chain is going to be impacted. The finance, financial institutions are putting ESG as part of their risk framework. So you go for a loan, you have to deal with it. You work with an international uh, company, you have to deal with it. So moving away from the personal choice and also from the regulatory, it's a, a business um, priority to deal with ESG in order to stay competitive. And one last thing, it actually saves money as well in many cases. Yes, you have to invest up front, but we have realized embedding sustainability for ourselves that it actually operationally, it costs less. We have reduced the traveling uh, to, to reduce the net zero uh, uh, emission, which by the way, as Deloitte, we have, um, we have committed to have a, a net zero emission rate by 2030, which is quite aggressive. And, and I fully endorse that. But operationally, that means uh, less costs as well. So we can achieve less costs and be attractive also for the talent pool, which is so scarce nowadays. Um, maybe unbelievable for me when I first started to work with Deloitte. Uh, this was a long time ago, but I would have never, never thought that in the, during the interview, I would ask my boss, what do you do with paper? But this is the question that we are getting now from our, from our youngsters. How do you recycle paper? What do you do with plastic? Do you use plastic in the office? And I'm glad that I'm getting these questions because this younger talent pool are, are uh, cautious about the environment. And to be attractive, we have to embed sustainability. And that's enough because I can talk all day, so. No, no, thank you. This is really fascinating. I'm just wondering now, because you said you deal with uh, in your portfolio with EU and non-EU companies. And I wonder then, do you have two parallel tracks for these different, or do you have a consistent approach? And if so, uh, when you say that the regional leg regulatory framework is not yet that uh, developed, does that mean that indeed what you are in a way, and the industries are in a way setting the standards ex instead of the governments? Yes, and, and, and I truly stand behind that. We have companies that are sponsoring this event, and I'm, I will not name them, but they have chosen to embed sustainability, even though regula regulatory in our region, in the Western Balkans, uh, is not there yet. They are leading by example, and that, that is, those are the companies that we are serving. Uh, in the EU countries, it's becoming mandatory for most of the companies, and, and there the discussions are somewhat different. But this is actually great because we also have an example to learn from. So Western Balkans now has an opportunity to learn what is actually happening in the EU countries and adopt that, of course, with the local flavors. But that is something that uh, it's also a luxury because it's being done somewhere else and it can be replicated in, the, in, in our region as well. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that if any of you would like to intervene or comment, uh, please do so. Um, but let's now move to our next panelist, Mr. Luzim Rafuna, and he's speaking here on behalf of both the Kosovo Chamber of Commerce as its president and Chambers of Commerce and Industry from Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro in Serbia in his capacity as a president of, the, of something that is called WB6CIF, sounds like a secret service. <laughs> um, so would you like to 
to explain to us how the chambers of commerce support companies uh, in their efforts to comply with these requirements, given your unique relationship uh, uh, and, uh, of trust and capacity to influence them. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, yes, the, the Chamber of Commerce in, in Western Balkan can play the crucial, uh, crucial role in promoting ASG. Uh, compliance company and uh, regulations. So chambers of commerce are in unique position to, to help the business slowly, that uh, very easily to pass the transition phase. So there are some steps where the chambers of commerce can uh, contribute or can help the companies. The first is uh, facilitating network uh, opportunities. That, um, that means the Chamber of Commerce can facilitate network opportunity for their members to share the best practice on SG compliance. They can organize industry-specific events, conference, forums that bring together business expert, policy makers, and uh, also the partners from the government. Secondary is providing advisory service. Uh, chambers uh, of Commerce can, pro can provide advisory service to their members on ASG compliance. They can help businesses assert access to their current ASG practices, identify areas for improving and develop action plans to implement the ASG practice. Uh, chambers of Commerce also can offer assistance in, uh, to help the companies to access in funding and all the resources that can support the adoption of ESG practice. Uh, third, Chambers of Commerce can uh, develop ESG guidelines that provide practical advice to companies how to implement the ESG practices. These guidelines can be drafted or written for specific needs of different industries and sectors and can help businesses to understand the benefits, benefits of ESG compliance. And fourth, also to organize training and education pro programs to cover the topics such as environmental management, social responsibility, and corporate governance. So these are the main steps which chambers of commerce can help the businesses slowly to pass the transition phase. Thank you, that's, that's really good. So you have so, so to say, a strategy that is based on these. Uh, and, and where are you now in terms of delivering these aspects? What, what is a priority? What is happening on the ground? And you have this unique position. You have a hand on the pulse of the local businesses. So where are they in this journey? Uh, we are, it's quite challenging for the businesses because the first, they have limited resources. Yeah. Secondary, they are limited in finance. And um, we working together with the, with the business, and we offer the, the services uh, in, to help them slowly. They to how to say not to feel it very hard. This uh, this uh, passing these steps. So we working with them, and we go slowly with them step by step to to, to prepare them to to, uh, to adapt the ESG practices and regulation. Thank you. And I obviously don't know, but I would uh, think that this is not something where chambers of commerce are ordinarily specialized. So where do you draw your expertise and do you partner? I know that this, uh, you collaborate within the region and share experiences, mm -hmm. but who are your partners and how do you build your own internal capacity to be able then to support businesses? Uh, the first partner is the government. The mm -hmm. government helps us with the funds and we find the experts to bring to, to, to the Chamber of Commerce and they to train and to educate the, the businesses. Secondary uh, are the international don donators which help us with expertise and that means we importing the expertise also from, from donator partners. And the third, it's um, between us, we exchange the experience between chambers of the commerce. And this has helped us a lot to, to, how to say, we to prepare more easily the business for this stuff. So. 
Thank you. And, and I'm curious, how, do you, how susceptible do you think businesses are to this change? Uh, do, does this message that we are sharing here in this kind of high level event, does it actually trickle down to actual small and medium? Because I think that um, you, you, you support largely small and, and medium enterprises. So how are they, how, how is ESG agenda? Um, the businesses were aware they doesn't have plan B. They know that this is obligation, they should fulfill uh, the, all this uh, obligation. And they accept, but uh, only the request from the business is not to, how to say, not to go so fast. I mean, because of these challenges which I mentioned in the beginning of uh, my speech. So it's not any, if you allow me to say in breaks, any resistance or any compliance or something, but all the idea is to go step by step slowly. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, Mrs. Sasha Nyagun, founding partner of Sustainary Partners and a highly esteemed expert in, on ESG in the investment management industry. She will share with us some insights from this industry. Somebody thinks that I'm talking too much, so <laughs> over to you. Well, I think, you know, I'll try and, and pick up themes that, that I've heard uh, from other speakers. I don't want to repeat and pile on. Uh, but there is an element of, of um, a, a huge driver really coming from institutional investors. And let us you know, be clear, they own the world. You know, the PRI group that that's, uh, uh, Robert mentioned uh, in his speech, they are the people, you know, th those are the companies, institutions that practically own any, any meaningful capital uh, in the world. And, and what they need to comply with and what they want comes down all the way down the, the value chain so uh, and comes down to us right um, and they were up in arms let's say from 2016 uh, that's when the, the hysteria started in in the investment community about ESG how what, what are we going to do what does it actually means that's when they were uh, as Olinda mentioned they, that's when they were starting to uh, hire people to be you know their chief sustainability officers or heads of sustainability in their firms put processes in place because it all starts with, you know, gathering the information, putting strategy and, and processes in place to gather the information, then analyzing that information, then benchmarking that and so on. So in terms of what the businesses here need to do is, you know, first it is collecting that information. Yes, get somebody to, to, to really focus on that. This is not uh, a job that can be done on the side of your table. You cannot put, make your chief financial officer, also your head of sustainability. They need to focus on that day in, day out. That's their job, only that. And they focus on that. So they might have consultants to help them, but you need somebody in-house to really drive the initiative. Get the data and then look at, you know, what's your performance and how can you improve it, right? But, you know, the first obligation, and we heard about uh, the CBAM, it's first reporting, and then you're going to be asked to improve, right? And then you're going to get penalized if you don't improve. And, and that's exactly how investment community works. So it, it sort of starts with uh, gathering the data about the uh, investee companies. This is, this is our companies, right? Um, uh, or, or their supply chain. Um, there are some mandatory indicators, they call them principal adverse indicators in, in the regulations in the EU, uh, 14 of them, so you, know, you can start with those. These are the 14 data points that we need to collect, let's start there, right? Because we will need to report that immediately, practically, SFDR reporting is now for institutional investors, so you need to have that data for them, because at some point, to begin with, um, there is a, a, a regulatory um, allowance for not having complete data, right? But that's not going to be forever. So you might be dropped off from the investment simply because you do not have data about your performance because th then your investor cannot comply with this regulation. Um, so, so I would say start there uh, and then look at how you perform. Then we're going into, well, are you something that is... Um, that, that can qualify as sustainable investment, right? And we will talk about that uh, later on uh, about the, uh, when we talk about the ESG strategy.
but um, you start with you know the general compliance and then you need to improve then you need to become a desirable investment for these um, um, institutional funds right and that's where sustainable investment comes in play so you need to make a significant contribution to one of those uh, um, uh, uh, objectives that that uh, um, uh, we saw in the OTP presentation so the six of them right now, there will be uh, social taxonomy as well. And you need, of course, to comply with all the uh, international regulations about human rights. And then you become this fantastic investment, a desirable, right? You're not just compliant, you're a desirable uh, company to work with, your desirable investment uh, for, these, uh, for these organizations. And that's, that's where you want to get to. But first, get, um, get the reporting, right? Thank you. And I wonder, obviously, I'm not sure if you know that, but I wonder, is there any figure or any estimate saying how much investment the region is losing because they cannot meet these standards that uh, are expected? I'm not aware of research like that. Um, I think that investors bit... simply don't go. I think it's a little bit too early because it hasn't hit quite yet. Uh, for, for the exclusions. You know, the exclusions right now in the investment community are about things you cannot fix, right? Your, your, uh, they might exclude investment in tobacco industry, they might uh, include, exclude investment in any companies that are involved in violations of human rights, they will not want to uh, invest in, you know, weapons of mass destruction, you know, production and stuff like that. Coal is next on the chopping block, by the way, so anything to do with coal, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a big one uh, that, that, will, that will go next and then expand to fossil fuels. Um, but, you know, uh, an energy inefficient company right now I don't think is seen as an exclusionary point for institutional investors. Uh, it, it might become if they have their own decarbonization targets for their portfolios, so might, they might drop the investment in that company because it's not contributing to uh, their objectives, uh, but it's not, not going to fail right now, so we cannot measure that kind of impact right now. But in five years' time, I'm sure there will be uh, analytics to, to, to show that, Th those who have lost out and those who have gained. Thank you. And I just wonder also, I mean, there's a lot of complex terminology in ESG, a lot of different terms. People sometimes feel they do not want to ask because, you know, they will show that they are not familiar enough. Um, so, uh, for instance, what can you tell us about this concept, do no significant harm? What does it represent? How is it measured? How is it translated in reporting? How do we operationalize these kind of elusive terms? Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful actually this conference is in English because I, I struggle a little bit with uh, translation so that, that's good that I can, I can speak uh, in English. So do you know significant is what, harm is one of those terms that was invented practically for EU taxonomy. Uh, so I mentioned contribution to one of the objectives, we saw the six objectives, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, uh, you know, water, pollution, biodiversity, uh, and circular economy. So in order to be that desirable investment that I've mentioned, uh, uh, or a desirable company to invest in, you need to make a contribution to those. And there are specific metrics of how you make that contribution. But uh, it, that doesn't mean that that's enough. So for example, if you have a field of PVs, um, you know, in Montenegro, you know, or, or in Serbia, this is not enough to be a sustainable investment. Yes, you're producing renewable energy, but that is not enough. You need to make sure that your the human rights, um, you know, the, the labor rights, uh, um, you know, you're compliant with OECD rules, so that's the minimum standards, and then you have the do no significant harm, which looks at uh, other objectives. So you might be, for, um, you know, mitigating climate by producing renewable energy, but what you're doing regarding pollution, right? What you're doing, you cannot have blind spots. So you have to also comply with minimum criteria in those, uh, and EU taxonomy has very helpfully defined minimum criteria and significant contribution, which cannot be said for SFDR, which is uh, the regulation that really hits uh, asset managers. Uh, it, it has a much vaguer definition of everything uh, of sustainable investment, if, if it can be called definition. Um, so uh, EU taxonomy is a really useful tool to, to look at right now. It's the most precise document that we have. All the other taxonomies that I have mentioned, you know, UK taxonomy, Asian and so on, they're still at a vague stage. EU taxonomy gives us actual metrics. So do no significant harm means no blind spot. You need to have some minimum standards across all relevant topics 
in ESG, and then you get to the next level by making a significant contribution uh, to resolving a issue that's important. Thank you so much. And can I just invite now all of you um, to tell me if, if you'd like, you don't have to, uh, some examples from practice, some examples of good practice, something that you would like to share with the audience that they can take away and implement uh, right now. Um, maybe hire a sustainability officer, or what would that be? What, what, uh, and can you, can you draw on your ex respective expertise and practice, what's going on in your fields? Do you want me to go first? I would like to invite oh. everyone. I can't stop talking anyway. Um, well, from my very painful experience of, of doing this both in-house as a consultant, uh, get yourself an, uh, a data management system. Th we're talking about large quantities of information. You need to have a system. This is not an Excel spreadsheet kind of exercise. So very practical, very boring, uh, but it will save, save a lot of headache. Uh, and there are platforms out there that will be suitable for your business to, to use to gather the data and make the reporting. That's a good one. Thank you. I'll chip in with a, with a couple of examples. Um, the first is, I think, everything to do with, I mean, you start, I think, Sasha has magisterially explained how you begin this process. Uh, it, is, it is the word scoping. It's scoping of your business on the basis of already established criteria. Now, the scoping exercise is one which has two parameters. First is identification, so using the criteria and mapping your business on the basis of these criteria. I, for example, often talk about you know, the five R's of the circular economy. Look at your practice and, and, and think, you know, rethink, reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse. Look at all of the various, if you're in a manufacturing entity, take these criteria and simply map them to your exercise. The second that I would mention, and we'll talk about risk management, and that's more my field, which is everything to do with risk. That is mapping your business from the perspective of risk. Now, that's of course something that requires assistance. But the risks in this area are fourfold. I know I'm preempting a question you were going to ask me, but let me use it, let me ask, answer it now. The first is the simple profit margin risk, which has two components. The first is what Sasha was talking about. You do not implement these principles. You become an unfavorable or not interesting investment. Point number one. Point number two, you lose consumers because the consumer industry is, is all about increasingly making educated choices based on ESG metrics. Risk number two, reputational harm. Another example I will give you. Uh, I'm working with a big company which all of a sudden is manufacturing in the Middle East, comes to me and says, well, we have a problem with the hiring of labor forces from another country. I'm not going to mention the country. How do we deal with that? One advice that we gave is hire local counsel to be able to interact with the workforce. Because one thing multinationals often do is they send somebody you know, from Washington or Brussels into these countries, and all of a sudden, they think they're going to be very persuasive into a local culture which has been developing for years in a different social context. So that's one tool. I mean, sustainability is also about context and relevance. Third risk is everything to do with dispute resolution. Uh, you want to be in a position where you assess what is my litigation risk? To what extent am I open to cross-border suits because I do not engage with these with these principles. And that's, that is a crucial part. And at least now in the EU, and that's the fourth risk, that's regulatory compliance. Being in a position to have to demonstrate regulatory compliance ESG reporting, as Sasha was talking about, which will migrate into other regions as well because of the indirect effect of the Brussels regulation. Thank you so much. These are really uh, very useful takeaways. And uh, 
How about others? Would you like to? I can chip in as well. Good. Um, I'll provide some practical tips. Um, it may sound strange, but one of my uh, main advice is to actually diversify the leadership. The board, the executive, whatever governance structure they have, if you diversify it based on age, gender, educational, or professional background, that will bring sustainability as part of your discussion points. Um, it sounds strange, but it, that's, that's just uh, how it happens. A second practical tip is, as I mentioned earlier, get a sustainability, sustainability chief officer. This topic needs to be part of the agenda. And when you nominate somebody either externally or internally, uh, that topic will become part of the agenda, will get the support needed, and then drive it forward. And then third practical example is get familiar with the topic. I know that um, it is not as um, common, uh, top, especially in, our, in the Western Balkans, to discuss about this. But the more we talk about it, the more attractive it will be, both from the talent perspective and also from the uh, supply chain perspective. These are very practical tips um, to get our arms around it. Because once we actually get our arms around it, then that's when the real work starts. But for that, uh, and I'm not trying to be aggressive here, but for that you need uh, outside consultants. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, very useful tips indeed. Um, can we? Can I invite? Without pressure, we have a few more minutes. I would no, like no, to of hear. Course. I just wanted to add that uh, uh, listening about uh, all things that has been said, it is kind of uh, conclusion came to me that in Western Balkans, it is likely that this. ESG transition could be industry driven rather than government driven. I think that on a short term, the pressure will be on the industries and government will kind of have more time to think what to do, but industry will not be, not that have that luxury in order to keep their business flows. They will need to comply immediately so that uh, we can expect that this transition in Western Balkans could be maybe industry-driven, not government-driven. Thank you very much. And Mr. Rafuna? Yes, from the uh, perspective of the companies in Western Balkan, the companies can take several steps, step, sorry, several steps to prepare themselves for compliance with uh, the new EU, uh, EU regulation related to, related to ESG. For example, companies should conduct a gap analy analysis to identify areas where the currently falls short of the new EU regulation related to SG. This analysis will help them to identify the gaps and to uh, prioritize the action needed to comply with the new regulation. Second, companies should establish the ESG strategy, which will be in line with the EU regulation. This strategy should be developed with input from the key stakeholders, such as employees, investors, consumers, and regulators. The company should invest in training and education. And fourth, they should work with suppliers and partners. So the companies should be ensured that they are comply with the EU uh, regulation related to ESG. This is will help companies to ensure the integrity of their supply chain and to reduce reputation risk. Thank you very much. I definitely have, I don't know about the audience, but I, it, I have so many points that I need to process. Uh, there are there's a lot of very useful advice. So uh, if I could summarize, uh, and I don't know if you would agree with me, but this is very much um, a joint enterprise in a way that it is not just, even though you say this is largely business driven, but there is also a grassroots element uh, from new generations, younger people uh, who demand 
different model of doing business. And we heard in the pre earlier uh, panels about what governments and how well prepared. So in a way, we couldn't potentially say that there is one center of gravity that drives this agenda. It, is, it has a buy-in um, from all of us. And I, I know we tried to not sound alarmist and to just talk about the risks and dangers, and I'm very grateful to you all for uh, emphasizing opportunities and benefits and showing the way that is not all about, oh my God, something terrible is going to happen if we do not. So I do hope that that is the overall, overall message uh, from this panel. And I'm sure that this conversation will continue. Uh, so I would like to thank you so much for being very efficient, for keeping time. And I know everybody's probably uh, hoping for a break. So I would like to invite everyone to thank our panelists and close the panel.